it works. So if you want, right, you, you can transfer those capabilities to uh, Rohit. Yeah, I'm available. All right, that uh, you should have host privileges now. Hey, we're at the, uh, the start time for the session. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Matthew Dosange. I'm your session chair for uh, this morning's session. Uh, we have three great talks. Um, do we, um, Manju, do you think we should uh, give a couple sentences for people to filter in or? Yeah, I, I think it should be good. Like maybe you can give a minute, right? Okay, we'll get started in about a minute, so roughly at um, 11.37. Right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is our technical paper session uh, C on congestion control. Um, our first paper is improving congestion control through fine-grained monitoring and of infinite band networks by Alberto Castejo, uh, Gabriel Gomez Lopez, Jesus Esquerdo Sequillo, uh, Pedro 
uh, Javier Garcia and David Isen uh, and uh, other at all. Um, I'll go ahead and start the video. Uh, and please ask questions in the Slack channel for this paper. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Gabriel Gomez Lopez. I am from the University of Castilla-La Mancha. And today I will present our work called Improving Congestion Control Through Fine Grain Monitoring of Infiniban Networks. This work is the result of a collaboration between the University of Castilla-La Mancha and the University Carlos III of Madrid. In this slide, uh, we can see the outline of the presentation. Uh, first, we will talk about the introduction, followed by the background, congestion control and fine grain monitoring. Then we will talk about the evaluations and finally we will talk about the conclusions and future work. The interconnection network is a fundamental system in high performance computing clusters and data centers. This interconnection network must provide high bandwidth and low latency to avoid congestion that might be created in the network. There are numerous network technologies focused on providing these features. One of the most successful ones is the InfiniBand. The InfiniBand specification defines a congestion control mechanism whose behavior is defined in a configuration file before the setup of the network. So these parameters are fixed and cannot be modified when the setup phase is finished. This is a problem because congestion by nature is very dynamic and the configuration that might initially be well suited may be inadequate as communication patterns in the network change. For that, we propose to combine a fine grain monitoring tool, Limitless, with the InfiniBand Subnet Manager, OpenSM, so that uh, the InfiniBand congestion control parameters are dynamically and precisely tuned to the network traffic conditions. Let's talk now about the background. First, let's talk about the monitoring tool that we have used in our proposal. Limitless is a lightweight monitoring tool for large-scale systems. The architecture of this monitoring tool is based on three, three based overlay network, T-Bone. This architecture offers simplicity, scalability, and fault tolerance. Uh, currently, the monitor using the 200 milliseconds uh, sampling period consumes less than 3.1% of CPU time per hour. The objective of the monitoring tool is the fast data collection, low overhead, and the its integration with external components. For the data collection, this monitoring tool recollects uh, general purpose performance metrics like CPU usage, memory usage, or input output performance metric and the InfiniBand performance counter, like Porik Smith weight or Porik Smith data. Here we can see the architecture of the limitless monitor that is based, as we, can, as we have said before, in T-Bone's architecture. And so it's hierarchical and is composed by three components. First, we have the demo monitor that recollect and send the performance metrics to the aggregator that is in charge to send efficiently uh, this information to the servers. The servers process and store this information in the databases. Here we can see an example of deployment and the, the deployments are user defined. It can be designed like the platform topology. The aggregators are optional but located in medium large deployment for efficiency and it is possible to uh, use different configurations for the daemon monitor, like the sample interval. Currently, the information is forwarded by the server component to the subnet manager. The next state consists of communicating its uh, daemon monitor through OpenSync with the subnet manager. This generates new considerations, like if the subnet manager could be a bottleneck. Let's talk now about the congestion control mechanisms of InfiniBand networks. Let's see how it works with this sample in which uh, so HCA send packets to a destination HCA uh, through a switch. 
When the threshold in the output port in the switch is exceeded, the packet that cross through that output port will be marked according to the marking rate parameter with the FECON bit. When the destination uh, HCA receives uh, the packet with the FECON bit, it will, be, it will send back to the source HCA a packet with the BECON bit. It's time that the source HCA receives a BECON, the CCT index will increase as much as the CCT increase parameter indicates. That will penalize the time that the HCA must uh, wait to send a new packet. When the CCT I timer expires, the CCT index will decrease one unit, coming to zero if no more bacon packets are received. As we can see, the ingestion throttle could be difficult to be well adjusted. Congestion is by nature very dynamic and it is very complex to keep track of congestion routes. This leads to instabilities uh, in the performance of NetCore using the InfiniBand congestion control system. Uh, with our proposal, we won't make this task simpler and more efficient. Let's talk now about the congestion control and fine grain monitoring. Now uh, we will see how our, our proposal works, uh, the dynamic reconfiguration of the InfiniBand congestion control parameters. Initially, uh, we have uh, the CCT increase parameter set to zero. So when a bacon is received in an HCA, the CCT index will not increase. Limitless is connected to all the HCAs of the network and reads the performance counter of InfiniBand and storing a temporary file that is read by OpenSM. If when OpenSM reads the, the temporary file and detect that there is congestion in a source HCA, we'll send a new congestion control configuration to that HCA with a new value for the electricity increase parameter. In this case, we have set to 5. So when a new bacon is received, the CCT index will increase in 5 units. With our proposal, we've, we achieve to only apply congestion control when real congestion is in an HCA. And also, we can apply different configuration in each HCA dynamically according to the information provided by Limitless. The implementation of our proposal has been carried out in the OpenSM routing engines. We have implemented a political function that is executed in a time interval that we define it at the time of running OpenSM. This periodical function executes the function RE rate monitor that reads the performance code stored in the temporary file but limitless. Then the RE CC of the HCA uh, decides which HCA needs to update uh, its congestion control configuration. If an HCA needs to update uh, its congestion control configuration, we use the, la the last two functions to encapsulate the new congestion control configuration in a math message and uh, to send this math message to the HCA. Here we can see the diagram of the update HCA algorithm. This is executed after reading the performance content for all HCAs to check if any HCA needs to update its congestion control configuration. First, we use the CC modified variable to avoid sending the congestion control configuration when it is not necessary. If CC modified is false on product is midway exceeds the upper limit, we put CC modified to true, set the CCT increase value to the new CCT value that is different from zero, and send the new congestion control configuration to the HCA. So now that HCA will start to apply ingestion throttling. If HCC modified is true and product's midway is under the lower limit, there is no congestion and the HCA doesn't need to apply ingestion throttling. So HCC modified is set to false and the default congestion control configuration is sent to the HCA with the CCT increase 
a parameter equal to zero. Let's talk now about the evaluations. According to the hardware test based configuration, we have used the Thalia cluster. That it composes 550 server nodes. Every server node has an Intel Xeon 8 cores with a 16 GB of RAM and an HCA port, a dual port Melanox Connect X3. Thalia uh, has also uh, 15 Melanox 8 port switches and we have used QSFP copper cables. All Melanox components are using the QDR uh, technology with 40 Gbps. The topologies that we have used to test our, our proposal is uh, 56 nodes, two dimensions K and S that we can see in this image, and the 56 uh, 56 nodes, three states, is limit factory that we can see here. We have used uh, three different congestion control configuration. The first one is with a congestion control, the second one is the standard infinite congestion control mechanisms, and the third one is dynamic congestion control configuration, limitless plus uh, CC. This is our proposal. In this table, we can see the parameters that we have used for, for the congestion control. Note that we have used uh, different uh, values for the CCTI increase to study the impact of the variation of this parameter on the congestion control efficiency. The rest of the parameters have been configured as recommended in other studies. Uh, note also that there are two uh, proper parameters for our proposal, upper limit and lower limit. According to the network workloads, we have used these two benchmarks. The first one, netcode, offers a variety of traffic patterns. We have used efficient Byzantium bandwidth and n to one traffic pattern using 36 MPA tasks. The second one, GPCNet, split the network into two groups. One group is the metrics nodes and is composed by the 20% of the nodes of the network and the rest are used to create congestion in the network. The group of metric nodes uh, run the test random ring point-to-point -point latency, random ring point-to-point -point bandwidth with synchronization and no reduced latency test. These tests are running before without congestion in the network and after that the congestion nodes start to generate traffic in the background and in the background and then the group of metrics repeat the test to measure how is uh, how much is the impact that congestion has in the network let's see now the results obtained in the benchmarks uh, first uh, we'll see the results of netcode's benchmark uh, using the limit factory topology and end to one traffic pattern as we can see, there is no performance gain for limitless plus CC compared to the CC and without CC configurations, since uh, the end-to-end -end traffic pattern does not generate between flows. This uh, uh, is observed also in the KNS. There is no performance gain for the limitless plus CC compared to the CC and the without CC configurations. However, if we observe Polyxmic Midway performance counters, we can see interesting results. This chart shows the Polyxmic Midway performance counter values versus time during the execution time of the end to one traffic pattern. We have set the CCTI increase parameter to 5, which it is an intermediate value making the injection throttle more sensitive to the network traffic status. These results show that when we use limitless plus CC, the packets are waiting to be injected for a significantly shorter period of time. Therefore, the injection throttling is working smoothly with our proposal, regardless the network topology. 
If we look at the EVB traffic pattern in the Slim FAT3 topology, we can see that there is a significant performance degradation when CC is configured with higher CCT increase values. And these differences are even worse in the KNS topology. However, these differences are minimized when limitless plus CC is used. For that, our proposed reduced effort to turn the CCTI increase value. If we observe the Porekit's midway results for CC, packets do not need to wait too much in average to be injected. When lead congestion arises, CC triggers immediately the throttling of the traffic flow generating the lead congestion, even though this congestion is not dangerous. Note that uh, the Porekit's midway values for limitless plus CC remain well below 0 0.85 milliseconds which it is statically the value of the upper limit parameter, so that the injection of throttling is not enabled unless Porekit's midway values are higher than 0 0.85 milliseconds. This slide uh, shows the results for the GPC net uh, point to point bandwidth plus synchronization test for the Slimet FAT3 topology. We have focused on the GPC net test since we are interested in the bandwidth results. We have collaborated in green the table cells where limitless plus congestion control outperforms the standard congestion control of InfiniBand. As we can see, our proposal outperforms most of the times uh, the standard congestion control system, no matter if there is congestion or in the network or there is not congestion when the tests are run. And also, uh, these results are independent of the network topology, as we can see in this slide, showing the same results for the KNS topology. Note also that our proposal remains invariant to the different CCTI increase values, meaning that this approach will save effort to the network administrator, as they will not need to pay attention to configure the CCTI increase parameter. This slide shows the results for the Porek Smith data performance counter values, obtaining when running the complete GPCNet benchmark in a metric node. During the execution of GPCNet, first the point-to-point -point latency test is run, then the point-to-point -point plus synchronization, and finally the all reduced test. This is test lasts around 40 seconds, and they only generate traffic in the metric nodes. After this period of time, the congestor nodes generate a strong congestion. In the case of the KNS topology, the Porek Smith data result shows that when there is no congestion, limitless plus CC configuration obtain the best results, outperforming the without CC and CC configurations. Note also that the performance of timing by GPCNet in the KNS topology is significantly higher than in the Slim FAT3, since the former has a higher reception bandwidth. When congestion starts after 40 seconds, the amount of traffic derived by the network is reduced to 250 megabytes uh, per second for the Slim FAT3 and to 1 gigabyte per second for the KNS topology. Note that congestion node generates a big amount of traffic, so that congestion impacts on the overall network performance. Also, the limitless plasticity bandwidth results for the SMF3 topology are similar to those of CC configuration. Note that for the KNS topology, limitless plus CC outperform the CC configuration which uh, does not react properly to the congestion. On the other hand, the values for the Porekis midway indicate that the time waited to send data for the limitless plus CC and without CC configuration are significantly higher when congestion appears, but there is also more traffic injected in the network compared to the CC mechanisms, since the later mechanisms always react behind the schedule to the congestion allowing the injection of traffic from congesting sources when it should throttle them. Finally, we will conclude this presentation talking about the conclusions and future works. In this paper, we have presented a new proposal to leverage a fine-grained monitoring tool, 
to obtain accurate information of congestion situations appearing in infiniband networks. The main drawback of the traditional infiniband congestion control mechanism is that network administrator needs to turn a set of configuration parameters. This turning uh, can be time consuming and not always assures the congestion control mechanism to operate successfully. As a solution, our proposal enables OpenSN to dynamically configure the Infiniva congestion control parameters during runtime, so that server nodes do not overread throttling the traffic flows unnecessarily. We have evaluated our proposal in a real cluster by running applications, such as the network, netcodes and GPC net benchmarks. As future work, we will extend our implementation in OpenSN with distributed processing of collected information. Thank you, uh, Gabriel, uh, and for that talk. And uh, if you wanted to ask questions, uh, the Slack channel is open. Um, I, as an initial question, to get started. Um, what do you think the biggest uh, challenges will be with this uh, future work? Um, particularly, like, how easy is it going to be to port to uh, a real or to uh, implement with uh, an open open SM? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, uh, for your future work here, um how uh how difficult uh, like do you see hurdles in or challenges with uh implementing this in the uh, OpenSM distributed processing yes uh, we would like to try to communicate the monitoring tool through the subnet agents so we are not sure if the OpenSN will uh, increase the CPU time. So I think that that will be the most difficult part of our future work, improve that CPU time. Thank you. Um... That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think we have a question coming in. But and if anyone has questions following this, uh, please feel free to put them in the Slack. Uh, a lot of times our uh, authors will go in and answer them in text uh, af well after the uh, talk. Oh, uh, are there any changes you'd like to see in OpenSM in the future for implementing uh, custom congestion control? Uh, was asked by Taylor Groves. Uh, yes, uh, we'd like to expand uh, our proposal to the official OpenSM uh, software. Like uh, uh, like reading the comparing the information of performance cultures to see uh, who is the real state of of the netcode to uh, apply the correct congestion control uh, mechanisms to apply correctly the parameters. So uh, that what is what we are trying with our proposal. All right, well, uh, uh, everyone to help me thank the uh, speaker again. Um, we will uh, move on to the next talk in the 
Uh, pleasure. Okay, the, the next talk is um, impact of Rati congestion control policies on distributed training of DDNs um, by Tanaranum Khan et al. Uh, let's go ahead and get it started. Hi, everyone. I'm Tarunno. And today I will be discussing on our paper, Impact of Rocky Congestion Control Policies on Distributed Training of Deep Neural Networks. This work is done in collaboration with the University of Texas at Austin, Georgia Institute of Technology, and META. To start with, we all know that distributed training is being used to solve the problem of bigger and bigger models, that is, uh, deep learning models are becoming very popular in all the domains but to reduce the training time which is uh, increasing because of these deep learning models distributed training is used which is basically a distributing the training task across multiple accelerators aka neural processing units so these npus can be either gpus fpgas or tpus distributed trainings come at the expense of communication overhead between these npus to synchronize either the model gradients or the activation so to maximize the performance, there is a push of using specialized distributed training platforms, which is being uh, used or which is being designed by the accelerator vendors or cloud various cloud platforms. Distributed training platforms are built using high-end compute and network components, and it differs from the commodity. It differs from the data center in this manner that there. Uh, commodity compute and network components are used. Distributed training platforms employ dedicated networks that separate training traffic from the rest of the data center traffic. Due to the growing size of its distributed training models and of training data sets, training platforms are often scheduled to perform only one training job at a time for the critical DNN workloads. Uh, so this is an example of a Xeon Facebook next generation large memory training platform. Here, each node is having three component. First is the NIC connected to the CPU, which is connected to the training accelerator. Also, each of these NPUs are uh, using the scale up accelerator fabric. And for scale out fabric, we are using the ethernet here. So because of these unique characteristics of deep learning platform or the specialized deep learning platform, it is crucial to revisit the networking stack and identify whether the current state of the art networking protocols are optimal for such platforms. We focus on RDMA over converged Ethernet or the Rocky protocol due to its compatibility with the current Ethernet based fabric and widespread usage on distributed training platforms. So RDMA over converged Ethernet is more efficient than lossless network, which was initially designed for these lossless networks, which is not natively supported on the Ethernet-based fabrics. To solve this problem, uh, baseline Rocky enforces congestion control through priority flow control mechanism. So the question is like, what is PFC? So PFC is that once the data once the data buffer has a data buffer usage is more than the threshold, then POS frames from the receiver side is sent back to the sender, which is the, which then stops sending the packet. And once the data buffer is less than the threshold on the receiver side, the receiver sends resume packet and thus the sender again starts sending the packet. So this is the PFC mechanism, which is used to enforce condition control. But this PFC mechanism suffers from many drawbacks in conventional data center environments, including unfairness, head of line blocking, and deadlock. A lot of recent work has been done in this area, which shows the importance of condition control on Rocky to achieve maximum performance with minimal PFC generation. So their focus has been to use to basically produce as less, as less PFC as possible, which will remove the problem of unfairness, head of line blocking, and deadlock. In this paper, we studied these different condition control schemes 
and identify how they are, how what is their performance on these DL workloads on specialized DL platforms. So our contributions are, this is the first work in our knowledge that evaluates the effect of different condition control schemes on distributed training. We also developed a simulator using AstroSim and NS3. AstroSim is a deep learning simulator which is responsible for simulating the deep learning workloads. And we have integrated it with NS3, which is a network simulator, which is which has the simulating logic of uh, each of these condition control policies. We provide a detailed analysis of the effect of each state of the art condition control scheme, either timely HPCC, DCQCN, or just PFC. For both single collective communication micro benchmark that is already used in all 12, and also on end to end training time for the DLRM workload. We found out that these different state of the art rocky congestion control schemes have little impact on the end to end training performance. And based on our analysis, we provide directions for designing an optimized yet low overhead congestion control scheme tuned for distributed training. So uh, let's head back to what is all reduce and all to all. So in all reduce, there are two steps, all scatter and all gather. And all reduce is a very famous collective communication algorithm and is used by various models. So here what happens is that a chunk of the data is sent to all the other nodes and there that is getting reduced. So here, as we can see that a chunk of the data is getting reduced in all these nodes. And then these, uh, this data chunk is then replicated to all the nodes, which is the second step, the step that is the all gather one. So here we have seen the reduce scatter and all gather step in all reduce collective. On the implementation side of all reduce, there are various ways which in which it can be implemented, either tree based or ring based. But more on this can be looked into the paper. For all to all collective communication, here a chunk of the data is sent to all the nodes. So we can see that here that a particular data is being sent to all the nodes. And the DLRM workload, which is the real workload, is used in both all to all collective and all reduced collective. All to all collective is used in the embedding layers, while as all reduced collectives are used in the MLP layers. So here the DLRM has three parts: MLP, bottom MLP layer, top MLP layer, and the embeddings. Embeddings and bottom MLP layer together are fed into the top MLP layer in the forward pass. And in the backward pass, the parameters from the Top MLP layer are fed into the bottom MLP layers and also on the embeddings. Also, other thing is about the parallelization strategy. So, embedding is using model parallel strategy, model, model parallel strategy, where each model is split on different NPUs, and MLP layers are using the data parallel strategies where the data is being split on different uh, on different NPUs. We are using the Astrosun. Well, we are using the AstroSense simulator for simulating the deep learning workload and integrating with NS3 to simulate the rocky condition control policy. AstroSense provide a high level interface to the user to define new DNN models and simulate distributed training on different network topologies and configuration. It has three main parts, workload, system, and the network layer. Workload layer is responsible for uh, the workload parameters which are defined by the user as either real system or compute simulator measurements. Then we have the system layer, which specifies what is the implementation of the collective communication mechanism the user want to use, which it can specify through the context that is either the implementation can be ring based or tree based or just direct. And then the network simulator is uh, connected through the AstroSense through the network API, and it can be either NS3 or any other simulator. We are using here NS3. Topology we are using is uh, similar to a closed topology. That is, we have eight spine switches, and all these spine switches are connected to all the tor switches. So we have eight tor switches. Each of the tor switches are connected to uh, sixteen GPUs. That is, each server uh, here we are kind of simulating Xeon server. So each server has six MV switches and eight GPUs and each of these MV switches is connected to all the GPUs and each of the GPU is also in the same rack is connected to the TOR. So we have eight racks and 16 GPUs per rack. So this is the topology which is used 
in all our experiments unless specified anything else. So uh, in the first scenario, we will be considering different collective commutation algorithm for single switch in cast case. So we started with a very basic case so that we can see how in cast uh, communication differs from the collective communications and how that can be extended for real time workloads like DLRM. So in the case of PFC only, uh, single switch in cast, once the switch queue threshold is re reached for the switch, then the PFCs are getting produced. And here, uh, the bandwidth, bandwidth is utilized efficiently. As, the, as here, we are using 200 GPBS bandwidth and 32 MB of switch in all our experiments. We can see that uh, it is that the switch buffer is actually the bottleneck. So once the uh, data exceeds the threshold, uh, post frames are started. Uh, post frames are being generated and from the receiver and sent back to the sender. So in the in cast case, we are considering it's basically uh, a eight GPU connected to a switch that is e GPU uh, that is the seven GPUs are sending back data to just one uh, GPU. So there is like one queue which is getting all the data and it's here in this case it's getting the seven x of the data and that's why it would exceed the threshold but once it's uh once the uh, all these um gpu starts like stop sending the data again the resume packets are sent and again they will start sending the data quickly so here the bandwidth is, bandwidth is efficiently utilized also another thing to notice is that there's no compute on npus like other condition control policies and also another but the problem with pfc is it suffers from several issues which includes head of line blocking unfairness etc in dc QC, in qcn in the same case uh no pfcs are produced because it works on the condition notification packet and accordingly it reduces or increases the rate so here uh the latency is also similar with the pfc case with the uh, only pfc case and no pfcs are produced here the cons are that a lot of parameters need to be tuned in dcqcn and there will be extra time for the computation of the complex logic for uh, identifying to uh, stop sending the packet or decrease or increase the rate in dc tcp here we are using this tcp at line rate and kind of uh, we simulate the same DCTCP as it is used in the HPCCP. DCTCP uses a simple marking scheme at switches that is, it marked packet by setting the ECM flag at switches. After receiving, receiving ECM packets, the window size is reduced. No PFCs are being produced in this case as well, and the latency is similar to PFC, uh, to PFC and DCQ in case. In timely, the PFC is waivers. PFC uh, timely is a trade based congestion control mechanism and based on the round trip time delay the rate is either increased or decreased initial uh, as the rtt initially is uh, way far than expected initial rate reduction is sharp as rate is reduced multiplicatively as in all other gpu the rate is quickly reduced the overall switch queue usage is reduced heavily under utilization of bandwidth and also maximum latency compared to other condition control algorithms HPCC, which is using in network telemetry for condition control. Here, also, the aim is to basically have the minimum queue size and which causes uh, not utilizing, uh, which causes not utilizing uh, the bandwidth as compared to the queue buffer size. It starts reducing the window size once it starts getting the axe and aim to use the minimum queue size. At every packet, there is also an int overhead as each switch adds this information to this packet. Hence, we are transferring more data than other condition control schemes, and this may increase flow completion. Uh, so this problem of adding uh, like extra overhead of data is solved by using HPCC pin, which does not send per packet feedback, hence feedback can be delayed. But as we are focusing on larger flow, HPCC pin finishes early. So, after seeing all these condition control, one thing important, especially for the longer flows, which we are considering here, is that that the aim is not having less queue utilization, but the aim is to properly utilize the bandwidth of the link as well as the queue buffer. So here, the best uh, or the ideal 
pattern could be when there is a cube build up and that gets emptied quickly. So moving on to single switch collective micro benchmark and considering this is in this figure, we are considering all to all and all reduced collective for 120 GPUs or NPUs which are connected to a switch. So here we are not seeing any congestion with NPUs connected in a single switch. This is because in earlier in cast case, what uh, let's take the example where, where only each GPUs are connected to a switch. In that case, uh, in the in-cast case, all the seven GPUs were sending data to just one GPU. And one of the, so this means that only one queue is getting all the data. But here, if we consider all to all, then it's, uh, which is uh, in, all, in all reviews also the same thing happens. So what happened is that uh, each of the NPUs is sending one by eighth of the data or basically a chunk of the data to each of the other NPUs. And this means that each of the switch queue is getting one by eight of the data from an NPU. And if we sum across all the NPU, then it is getting just X data. Whereas for just one queue in NCAST, we are receiving seven X data. So therefore we don't observe any congestion with NPUs in this case. In the case of pool level flaws topology, which we discussed earlier in the slides, uh, we are seeing, first of all, that there are four peaks here, this is because we are considering four chunks, that is uh, all to all or all reduces happening four times one by one, and we have divided our data in, as such into four chunks. In the case of TOR switches, we are not seeing any much any such condition. For spine switches, uh, we are seeing that uh, at different time, uh, like if we uh, consider the case where we have like three spine switches and we see that they have different queue buildups simultaneously for the same all to all collective flow. So this is because this one reason could be because of the ECMP protocol that is they are uh, receiving the different amount of data or like uh, different torsages are sending the data uh, which accumulatively becomes more or less depending on the spine switches uh, on them. So the spine switches have different queue buildups for the same all to all collective flow and even for the all reduced flow. More details on this can be seen in the paper. So for the completion type of collectives, for the all to all completion type, we see that the timely has the worst completion time for 128 MB. And the reason is because of the underutilization of the network bandwidth. Another reason could be that the parameters are not optimal for this scenario, but we have tried with various parameters and finally we use the parameters described in the timely paper. On the, when we do a comparison with 1D all reduced to 2D all reduced, when we see that uh, using 2D all reduced uh, like really improves the performance and reduces the latency. So having a, a having 2D all reduced or um, using the same, uh, basically having a collective aware topology is helpful. So topology aware collective communication mechanism causes less congestion. And as we can see that the PFC counter also reduce when we move from 1D all reduced to 2D all reduced. And also uh, the same thing is happening for the real time workload that is 1D DLRM to 2D DLRM. So in the real workload, we observe that the total exposed communication is comparatively lesser in topology aware collective and there is like a 4% variation between all these between all these collective algorithms. So uh, in all these condition control algorithms, there is a 4% variance with the worst being in HPCC. This is because of the issue of having extra, uh, having extra data being sent in every packet and this may cause uh, the problem of reduced good put, followed by timely and the rest of the condition control algorithm have similar latencies. So to conclude, uh, the condition control algorithms has not much effect in distributed training and specialized distributed training platform. The only benefits of these uh, condition control algorithms over the baseline PFC is that reducing the number of pause frames minimizes the chance of these different kind of issues like PFC deadlocks that can rarely happen in Halda network. 
another uh, problem with condition control algorithms are use of extra compute which is not there in the baseline pfc but still uh, using condition but still condition control are getting used to prevent these pfcs the communication patterns of distributed training are deterministic and repeated for each training iteration this is a very important property which can be used to create an optimized condition control algorithm so an optimized condition control algorithm can be designed which can be very low overhead by leveraging this deterministic communication behavior and setting the condition window to minimize the tfcs so in the future work we are working on creating this optimized condition control algorithm specifically for distributed training workloads thank you Let's uh, thank our speaker. Um, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, we, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Slack channel um, for this paper. Uh, as the the thing that came to my mind since uh, I'll did us start it off was uh, a lot of this seems to be based around a lot of your evaluation seems to be based around um like full application collectives and i'm wondering how this might translate to um other types of communication such as like neighborhood collectives or um very busy point to point and if you could speak more to that Hi, yeah, so um, so we only studied already an all to all, which was also being used in DLRM. And accordingly, uh, we identified what was the like uh, what was the communication pattern there and how we could leverage it further. For different for like other type of communication patterns, like it would be a good exercise to study them as well and identify how similar or different they are uh, with compared to what we studied and also. Are we seeing any congestion in those scenarios as well? Because it really depends upon how the communication pattern is happening between the NPUs and then only uh, see what's going on there. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Is there any consideration for um, just usually these are running on clusters? Is this uh, considering a single application or is there any consideration for? Um, having an application on a cluster that uh, would have multiple applications running on it. Yes. So uh, yeah. So currently we have to use like one application which was running on uh, these multiple GPUs, but we are uh, trying to extend that so that we can run like multiple applications at the same time and see how the communication is going on there as well. Okay. Uh, Makes sense. I think we have one question in chat. Al Davis uh, wrote, uh, Timely was the worst. Did you have a chance to, to consider Swift, which evolved from the same observed flaws in Timely, but it's still RTT based? Okay. Um, we did not actually got a chance to try with Swift, but yeah, yeah, but that, I would like, uh, like, thanks Davis for pointing this that. Uh, kind of Swift has tried to solve these flaws and which wasn't timely. So yeah, it would it would be great like to uh, in future to try out these experiments and see that uh, are we benefiting something from Swift which was missing in timely. That makes sense. Uh, if anyone else has questions, feel free to put them in Slack. Uh, a lot of our speakers will go in and uh, answer them in text. Uh, we're running a little bit ahead at this point. Let's thank our speaker again first. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. And uh, from there, uh, I think our next talk is at 12.35, so in this chat room. So let's... Uh, 
Uh, I think uh, you have uh, one more uh, uh, talk, right? I think it's. Uh, we have one more talk, but it's technically it set it to start at uh, twelve thirty-five. Oh, okay. Well, no, it's eleven thirty-five. Eleven thirty-five. Translating everything into mountain. Um, so, do we want to start that now, or do we want to? Yeah. Um, so, no, just want to make sure that uh, it's uh, Arista talk, right? Yeah, it's the Arista talk, and it's supposed to be at eleven thirty-five. So. Right. We can we start five minutes away. Only five minutes away, right? Okay. You want to yeah. take a break, five minute break? Sounds good. Okay. Five minute break and we'll uh we'll go to the uh how is the talk. It should be in the same uh yeah, uh, you don't have to get out of Zoom, just stay here. Right.
All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is a talk from one of our sponsors, uh, Arista Networks. Uh, Jeff Raymond will be giving it. Uh, as Vice President of EOS Software and Services, Jeff Raymond is responsible for the product management of EOS platforms as well uh, as the Associated Services and Technical Support Organization. Jeff is a 17-year veteran of the networking industry he spent 14 years at Cisco in a variety of project, product management and technical marketing roles. Most recently, Jeff was a senior director with product management uh, responsibility for the Nexus data center switching business. Prior to that, Jeff held roles as the technical marketing leader for the Catalyst uh, 6500 series and then Nexus 7000 series platforms. Jeff holds a a bachelor's of Science from the University of Virginia in Systems Engineering. Uh, he will be giving uh, a talk, uh, Networking, Monitoring, and Analytics at the Cloud Scale. So let's get this talk started. Hi, my name is Jeff Raymond, and I'm from Arista Networks. Thank you for having me. It's a great opportunity to speak at this year's Hot Interconnects Conference. I noticed that many of the sessions on the agenda are about hardware or data plane topics. So to mix it up a bit, I've picked a management plane software topic. I hope that's okay. In this session, we'll look at the transition to modern network monitoring, specifically the power that a state streaming architecture can provide to network operations. This is a short session, so let's jump right in. This topic is about network visibility, or in more specific terms, how we access controlled management plane data from networking devices and why it is important for network operations. What sort of data are we focusing on here? We're talking about the control plane and management plane data that is traditionally accessible via the command line of a particular switching or routing device. Things like the routing table, the MAC table, the interface counters, the fan speed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We refer to this data as the state of a device. And there is a lot of state on the devices themselves, but it isn't all that useful when the operator can only access the data on a box by box basis. So obviously we need to get all this data off of the devices. And what we want to do is bring it back to a centralized location where we can now start to see broader trends across the network, find problems faster, leverage analytics techniques, and much more. We want to get as much data as possible to help drive better insights, which is one of the keys here. The challenge, however, is that there hasn't been a really a good way to get data off of a device, especially a complete set of data. In fact, SNMP has been the most common approach that our industry has used, and it's pretty archaic. I'm talking about a protocol developed literally in the 1980s, but it is still generally used even today. These approaches use polling as the primary mechanism, where a, a management system requests data on some polling interval, often every five to 10 minutes, and this polling interval leaves blind spots for the network operator. We're talking about gaps in network events, limited feature coverage, so really not all of the state. There is no real-time view to the polling mechanism, and there's very little historical reference. This is why the, the kind of the saying, the network is always guilty until proven innocent even exists. It's because the networking teams don't have the necessary tools to be able to confidently report uh, on the root cause so it's easy to point fingers at the network. And this ultimately limits the visibility of any associated network management platform. So operators then resort back to the device command line for getting this state data, which then defeats the purpose of moving away from a box-by-box -box operational model, and the vicious cycle continues. And the problem is that in all networks, this only gets worse at cloud scale. Now you're not only talking about a few hundred switches, but more like tens of thousands of switches in the environment, Imagine you are troubleshooting a situation where some critical issue can only be diagnosed by finding the right counter that is buried in one of these 10,000 devices. It's a needle in the haystack problem that needs a better solution. So on one hand, the bulk of the networking industry has been using this archaic polling-based approach in management systems. But on the other hand, we have the promise of a self-driving network where everything is automated, self-diagnosing, self-correcting. And if we think about this self-driving analogy and apply it to the automobile, the only reason that we can automate the driving experience of an automobile is by feeding the car's systems with really, really good data. 
Real-time data from cameras and sensors and analytics are all required to adjust the car to the ever-changing environments of a road. So the same must be true for the networking industry. If we want to automate many of the regular networking tasks like troubleshooting, better data is needed. SNMP is not going to cut it and something has to change. And the good news is we have a better solution. Enter state streaming, a modern API-based approach for getting state data off of a networking device. State streaming is the 180 degree opposite of polling. State streaming is a push-based mechanism instead of a poll-based mechanism that's used in the polling model. What this means is that instead of requesting data every 10 to 15 minutes with a polling mechanism, state streaming sends out changes as they happen, only sending the diffs in the state database. As changes are pushed, the resulting network management system can now record these changes in a time series and start to see more granular state changes. This means that more network events are captured, not lost due to some polling interval miss. And this means more proactive networking, faster root cause, and generally better networking operations are possible. This is where we plug into the broader networking stack. The streaming API needs something to stream the data from and stream the data to. We are streaming data from the devices using the API and the device operating system. And we have to collect the data in a repository or backend database. Then we can massage the data with various analytics approaches or just view the data with an associated UI workflow. Just like SNMP had MIBS, state streaming needs an associated data model to be able to standardize the format of the network state. State streaming uses Yang as the generic language for defining this state. Now, Yang is, is not new. It's been used by vendors for years. The challenge is that it's always been largely vendor specific, which doesn't help a network operator using gear from multiple vendors. Traditional standardization efforts were not on the right track, but it was obvious to the large scale operators that a better solution was needed. So a few of the larger operators, in particular Google, AT&T, and Comcast, decided to define an operator driven standard called OpenConfig to help push the industry forward with a new multi-vendor approach to network state data. With the data model established, they then needed an actual modern transport to define the state streaming component. This is where gRPC comes in. gRPC stands for Google Remote Procedure Call, and is the state streaming transport protocol that OpenConfig uses. A connection is created using HTTP2 and JSON to be able to get this published subscribe model working for network devices to the repository. Operators have been pushing network vendors to add support for OpenConfig over the past few years, and it isn't yet feature complete, but the coverage is still growing as adoption grows as vendors continue to add feature set coverage. As one example, ERISA supports OpenConfig in our EOS software for customers that want to ingest the state streaming data directly from our devices. We also support the full EOS data set using our internal data models as a means for streaming the full device state. So this is what the network management framework starts to look like. State streaming is from the devices to a particular backend repository. These repositories can be open source, they can be vendor specific, they can even be customer specific. And similarly, the front end UI components for visualization also come in, in different choices of applications. For example, some large cloud providers have taken a software approach to build in their own telemetry systems and are able to stream directly to their own backend infrastructure. In other cases, a customer may prefer to purchase a more formal product from a vendor for a turnkey solution for collecting this state data. Some management systems are supporting native state streaming now, but to be honest, we've been surprised that the adoption hasn't been as strong across the network management landscape when the benefits are so obvious. When it comes to the do-it-yourself approach, there are many different choices for how to build a telemetry backend. Here are some examples of open source tools that can be a possible component to a telemetry solution. The selection and implementation of a telemetry system usually takes some measure of software development work beyond what the traditional network engineering team might be responsible for. So keep that in mind when scoping out the right approach for your environment. And many times the backend repository is a generic data store without networking specific context or applicability. So expect that there could be some customization required for your particular use case. There are cases where customers may already have an existing data lake system for collecting data across the infrastructure beyond just the network. The network operations team could start to stream this network state data into that infrastructure to allow for broader correlation across the data sets. As one example of open source, here's an example of streaming into a Grafana system with state streaming data. 
And here is an example of streaming into a vendor-specific management tool, in this case, Arista's Cloud Vision product. Now, this is more of a turnkey product that is able to collect state streaming data out of the box. And in this example, you not only see the networking context in the UI, but you can also see the level of granularity of the data. Subsecond level details of buffer utilization is the type of granular visibility that state streaming drives here. This is where the power of better data comes to light. This sort of event on the screen that you're seeing could have been a microburst scenario that was wreaking havoc on your applications. It is very difficult, if not impossible, to find the root cause of that sort of thing using traditional telemetry methods because of the imprecise polling mechanisms that don't catch this sort of thing. With state streaming, we are able to provide that level of visibility and proactively alert the operator of these sorts of issues. And faster time to root cause means faster time to innocence for the networking team. So in summary, I would offer that state streaming is a far superior technology that really should be the only choice to derive better data in today's cloud networking operations, including AIML techniques. We aren't going to get to a self-driving network environment unless we have better network data as a foundation. And we need newer, more granular technologies like state streaming and open config to get us there. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Let's thank our speaker. Um, thank you, Jeff, for that talk. Um, so we have Slack. Uh, if anyone has questions uh, on that, uh, Jeff might be over there to answer questions after this. Uh, question and answer period. Um, so uh, I guess well, the question I have as um, someone who primarily works in HPC is, uh, this, this sounds great for um, a lot of data center stuff. Um, how would you uh, pitch this to me as a someone who works on, you know, high-end supercomputers? Matthew, do you want me to take that question live? Uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I think it really comes down to the. Um, by the way, thank you for the question. I, I, I think it comes because it was definitely a more generic network context that I was uh, discussing it. I think that to the degree that Ethernet is the fabric uh, uh, choice in that supercomputer environment, this would be very applicable in identifying hotspots, for example, uh, in the fabric. Uh, because you know what we're talking about here is is just a, a um, looking for uh, areas where you, you would not otherwise be able to get something basic out of the network infrastructure like a, you know your CPU monitoring and stuff is relatively uh, easy to track. But when you talk about hotspots in a fabric, uh, a supercomputer type environment, and then you're talking about things that could, if there's bursts and things, that's why I showed that one example of, uh, of buffer utilization because those things are so instantaneous, um, typical systems aren't able to find that. And so, uh, obviously, this is discussed in an Ethernet context. Um, other uh, HPC fabrics would have perhaps different alternatives, but you know that's the to the degree that Ethernet is an appropriate fabric for for the particular workload. This would be very applicable for that. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, I think. Uh, we don't yet have any uh, questions on the Slack. So, uh, oh, it looks like someone had raised their hand. If you could please enter the uh, question that you have on the Slack. Um, and with that, we will close out this session. Um, and the next session, so we have a break um starting at uh the our lunch break that runs till about 1 30 pacific time uh at which point 
no, twelve thirty. Twelve thirty is specific time, so it's like forty five minutes. So What's that? It's a Twelve thirty Pacific time will start back, not one thirty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll uh, break for lunch and uh, we'll go back to the Zoom lobby and then you'll uh, we'll click on the next session and we'll come back. Again, uh, yeah. thanks everyone for um, attending this great session. Thanks, Mitchell. Thanks. Yeah. All. Yeah.